The Lord be with you. Welcome to our 9 a.m. service here on site and also a very warm welcome to those who are joining us online. I'm Pastor Siang Guan. I just want to uh, share this, how I've been reminded today the Lord is my shepherd, He's your shepherd and He wants to refresh us, you know, He wants to restore us, that calmness that, uh, that He wants to give into our souls as we assemble to worship Him. Yeah. So, before we do that, can I maybe ask uh, my brother Ken to come and let's just spend a moment of silence before the Lord. Even in, through the different seasons of our life, may we know the shepherd's presence and thank him as we prepare our hearts to worship Him. Lord, come and lead us. Morning, Church. Indeed, the psalmist also reminds us in Psalm 91, verses 1 to 2, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. We have come together as a family of God, in our Father's presence, to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace, that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's all take a few moments in silence that the Lord Holy Spirit search our hearts for anything that we may have done that would need to be brought up to our Lord for repentance and forgiveness. Let us now confess our sins together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has sinned against you and against our fellow man, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. So Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon, deliver you from all your sins, confirm, strengthen you in all His goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, let's rise, let's give God the praise He deserves.
Thanksgiving, let us pray to collect together. Father of mankind, who gave your only begotten Son to take upon himself the form of a servant and to be obedient even to death on the cross, give us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that sharing his humility, we may come to be with him in his glory who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Church, let us continue in our posture of worship and that we come to the Lord for prayer, Lord, as we Enter a discussion. Heavenly Father, we begin with praying for our Diocese of Singapore. Lord, we pray for our sister parishes, Christ Church and Church of the Epiphany. May they continue to be Christ centered and Christ focused in all that they do. We pray that you will strengthen and give wisdom to the vicars, clergy, and staff teams as they do your work daily. Here in our own parish of St. James, we pray for the upcoming Alpha Run, starting with the Alpha Intro Dinner on the 24th of August. Lord, we ask that many guests will be drawn to explore the deep questions of life and come to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray for those who have signed up or will sign up to help as facilitators that they will be led by your spirit to bring their testimonies and your light to their small group guests. Lord, we now pray for the world. We ask that you intervene to end the Ukraine-Russian war and to quell the increasing tension between China and Taiwan. Lord, you are sovereign over all and all things we trust in your sovereign hand despite what we see that is happening in this broken world here. For our own nation of Singapore, we thank you, Lord, for blessing our nation for the past 57 years and carrying us through many challenges and difficulties, especially through the past two years of this pandemic. Lord, remind us and help us to not take the peace and stability in our nation for granted, but to remember to always give you thanks in all circumstances and to trust in your sovereign plan for Singapore. May you grant wisdom to our government to do the right things to bring your country forward and to uphold our ways, your ways, especially in the area of family life. Now, Lord, we want to take a moment to pray for ourselves and to remember those we know who are suffering in body, mind and spirit. May they experience love, peace and comfort that only you can give. May you strengthen their body, mind and spirit. Heal them according to your grace, mercy, will, and in your perfect timing, whether it's through medical means or supernaturally. So church, let us now lift anyone we know suffering as such, by name to our Lord. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ken, for leading us in intercession. And welcome once again to the 9 a.m. service here. Uh, just want to take this opportunity. If there are some guests among us, this is your first or second time uh, just worshipping with us. Could you just give me a little wave so that we can recognise where you are seated? Anyone? Oh, welcome back. And those who are on, uh, online with us, if you are also uh, signing in for the very first time, just drop us a hello on the chat and our online host will love to connect with you, all right? Yeah, uh, we have two announcements and 
The first is really Alpha is back. 24th of August, uh, we are starting uh, with Alpha, and we are looking out for people to serve uh, on this Alpha run, right? You can serve as group uh, hosts, helpers, or you just want to be a befriender or in the background praying. Yeah, uh, please do so by uh, scanning the QR code on the right, and uh, it will take you to the form so that the team can connect with you. All right. So if you are also bringing friends, uh, do let us know, and you can scan the the code on the left uh, that you are bringing a guest, so that we can also be preparing to just pray and serve them during this upcoming uh, Alpha run. All right. So lock in your dates, and if you do need uh, hard copies of the invitation, I think on the way out the host will be happy to pass a copy to you. Oh, yeah, they are having it now. You can also just, as they come alongside, just indicate that you need one. All right, so uh, 24th of August at 7 p.m., dinner will be served, and then after that, they will just watch a short video and have some discussions. All right, so please lock in your dates. Uh, next is just to let the church know that I will be taking uh, seven weeks off and I'll be traveling overseas. So uh, during this time, you know, uh, uh, Pastor John <laughs> will be helping me just uh, uh, steward the staff team with Pastor Glenn. So please keep me in prayer uh, that this seven weeks will be a time of refreshment and also uh, safety as I travel, uh, especially in the States. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last but not least, yeah, I'm very happy to welcome back uh, to St. James's, uh, Kurt Johansson. Kurt is an old friend of ours. He calls St. James his Singapore home church. Yeah. And for some of you all who are new to Kurt, Kurt serves with Set7. It's a, a ministry that through the satellite TV uh, reaches out to the Middle East, North Africa region with the gospel. Yeah. Kurt, can you come and just give us a short update on what's happening in that area? Backing up what we're doing in the Middle East and North Africa, where we are making God's love visible to the millions and millions, actually half a billion people who have access to satellite TV. As you may have seen on this picture, you can see on the rooftops, they are cluttered with, tele with satellite dishes. Everyone has a dish, it's $20, then you have unlimited access to the whole world, and satellite TV cannot be controlled by any government. It's the only uncensored media that you have, and it can bring the gospel out to everyone in the Middle East in, in an indigenous way, 24 hours a day. Um, can we have the next slide? So you, again, you see all the uh, satellite dishes, they are just everywhere. Uh, next slide. So this is the area that we cover. Uh, if you see the next slide, uh, all the red, con red countries are speaking Arabic. So it's quite easy. 21 countries speak Arabic. So in one language, you can reach out to 350 million. Then we have uh, Iran and Afghanistan, where they speak Farsi, also called Dari, in, Af in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, there is a growing church uh, there, and they can watch that seven as well. And then we have the Turkish area, the yellow area, where they speak Turkish. So we have four channels in these three languages that broadcast 24 hours a day into the homes of millions and millions of people. Next slide. Uh, and it is the only uncensored information people can get. For most people, this is their church at home. If you live in Saudi Arabia or Iran, there is no church, there is no Bibles, but satellite TV, TV is there all the time. Next slide. Uh, so it can go into closed homes, into closed countries, women that are confined in their homes, children that are in refugee camps, they're actually 17 million refugee children who are locked down in camps in foreign countries. They can all watch that seven, and they watch actually more TV per day than anywhere else in the world per person. Next. So sadly, the Middle East and North Africa is where the whole 
where Jesus was born, the disciple uh, worked. It was a Christian uh, area. Now it's the area of the world with the lowest number of Christians. We really, really need to help these few Christians left. They're only 3 to 4%, and they're dying out, like in countries like Syria, Iraq, and Palestine. So I'm here to extend the Macedonian call, come over and help before it's too late. Next slide. So what we say is that the people of the Middle East are not resistant to the gospel. They just never had a presentation of it. They haven't heard. They never met a Christian. They never saw a church. They never had a Bible in their hand. But now, with the satellite revolution, they can watch Christ in their homes 24 hours a day uh, from Sat 7, which are based in the Middle East and have a lot of local staff who know the problems of the region, who know the target of the street, and can proclaim Christ into this in, uh, area in a very contextual way. So thank you for your prayers for this. It's very difficult. Uh, it needs a lot of money. But through the help of God's people around the world, we can do it. So thank you for your prayers and all the support you're giving us. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll continue our service. Uh, we want to bring to God our tithes and offering. But at the same time, let me just pray for uh, Kurt and also the ministry of Set7. Yeah. Lord, we want to thank you. Indeed, your word that proceeds from you will never return to you void. Lord, your word, as it falls into the fertile hearts of those who have never heard or seen till they come into an, an encounter with you, even through a medium like satellite TV, Lord, you bring life. Your Holy Spirit is able to break through all these barriers. So thank you for the ministry of Sat7 and others that, Lord, this gospel will indeed continue to grow and reach the ends of this earth. So we thank you that, Lord, even as a church, as we bring to you our tithes and offerings, Lord, you continue to consecrate, use and extend your kingdom for your own glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, and chapter 8, verse 1. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, 
and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Singapore, we just celebrated our National Day last Monday. And while well, that, that brings us with uh, gratitude you know, towards many who have worked hard um, generation after generation to bring Singapore where we are now, and it fills us with a hope for a better future, you know, a flourishing Singapore. We are also reminded um, um, of the challenging times ahead and the necessary steps we must take for, to realise the better future that we dream and hope of. But what if I were to tell you, now this is fictional obviously, but what if I were to tell you that this box contained the key to the flourishing of Singapore or even the whole world, you know? What would you expect to be in it? Perhaps the schematics to save an unlimited energy or an economic or a governance plan that would distribute wealth fairly and equally to all. Or maybe a way to take care of the environment such that um, humans and animals and sea life and plant life can all coexist and flourish in a balanced and um, symbiotic relationship. Or will really all this be enough, even if this box contains all these? Or what if I were to tell you that in this box contain the key to the flourishing of your personal life? What would you expect to be in it? Maybe the name of your future spouse, or the job that you were made to do, or maybe a potion you know, that would make kill you of anything. Or maybe just um, perhaps a million dollars or maybe ten million dollars. My wife wrote this when um, we just got married using my checkbook. She can't bank it actually. Don't tell her. <laughs> when John, the author of Revelation, saw the sealed scroll, that was exactly what she, he was expecting to be inside. Not, not $10 million, you know, but that um, it contained God's perfect plan for the flourishing, the redemption, the renewal, the perfecting of our world and every single individual in it, which it did. Which is why uh, in Revelation 5, which Pastor Glenn covered last week, when no one could open it, he wept loudly. The most important plan, God's plan for the renewal of the world, and no one could open it until Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain, the only one worthy, arose and opened it. Only Christ could open the scroll. Only Christ can unveil God's plan for the world and for us. And as he unsealed 
each of the seven seals, one at the time John held his breath in anticipation, what was going to be inside? Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, reveal your word to us, your plans for us. Keep us steadfast, keep us hungry, and give us courage. So that even as you command, we will obey and we will see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelation 6, verse 1 to 2. The first seal. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. And I imagine, bear in mind, this is just my own imagination. You know, we, the Bible doesn't tell us what's going through in John's mind. But I, I think it's quite plausible that as John watched the white horseman ride into the scene, it reminded him of another white horseman whom Jews were very familiar with, King Cyrus the Great. The scriptures explicitly write about King Cyrus in Isaiah 44 and 45, as well as in the book of Ezra. He was the one who um, saved the Jews from the oppressive rule of the, Roman, um, of the, of the Babylonians and enabled them to rebuild their temple and um, worship God freely. In fact, Isaiah calls him God's anointed, which meant Messiah. And my own guess is that as John looked at this white horseman emerging from the scroll of God's salvation plan, he wondered, will it happen again? Is he the one, you know, amidst severe persecution of discrimination and exile and torture and death, John wondered, hopefully, is this white horseman the one who would save us from the oppressive rule of the Romans and rebuild our temple so that we can worship God freely again? Is he God's Messiah? The white horse is significant because white is the horse of a victor, a saviour, a messiah. In fact, in the later parts of Revelation, we read that Jesus too rides a white horse. The crown is significant because that, mean, that meant that he was a king with power and authority and might. The bow is significant because during then, Rome hardly had mounted archers. Rather, it was a characteristic of Romans' neighbouring enemies. Could it be that God was again going to use a, a neighbouring enemy of Rome, a second King Cyrus, to destroy Roman rule and rescue God's people from cruel and severe persecution? Could it be that it might even be Christ himself, you know, with the army of God to crush God's enemies and save God's people? And I, John, looked and behold a white horse and his rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came conquering and to conquer. So much must have been going through John's mind as he saw the first horse, horseman emerging. But then came the second horseman and then the third, and then the fourth. And I suspect that John's heart sank. He knew immediately that this couldn't be God's Messiah. The second horseman, verse um, 3 to 4, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. And its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. The horseman who came to take away peace and promote war and strife and conflict, followed by the third horseman. When he opened the third seal, I heard the, sec the third living creature say, Come. And I looked and behold, a black horse and his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. 
And this is what the passage was saying. A denarius was a day's wage, and a quart of wheat was barely sufficient for one person to feed himself for that day. In the vision, the same denarius could also be used to purchase three quarts of barley, enough for a small family, but substandard in quality. Barley was a poor man's meal. In other words, what with the coming of the third horseman, people would work hard all day only to barely feed themselves. And for those who have to feed their family, it was even worse. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Oil for cooking, wine for drinking, which was of common use, now had to be carefully rationed and used only sparingly. The third horseman brought about scarcity and poverty and dissatisfaction. And finally, the last horseman who brought about death. Verse 7 to 8. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, behold, a pale horse, its rider was name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. What on earth was happening? Wasn't the scroll supposed to bring about God's some perfect plan for the world? Well, yes. But here's the thing. For God's perfect, redemptive, salvific plan to unfold and to be realized, He must first shatter the deceptive claims, um, salvation claims of the world. The four horsemen shows us a pattern of the world that we must be wary of and wary we must be because the first horseman is in white. He looks like Christ, but he is not. He offers, um, his, he offers um, looks like salvation, but it is not. He promised satisfaction, but it is not. And there is a telltale sign. His methodology. He comes out conquering and to conquer. In other words, he uses might and power and control to overpower his enemies. He offers us might and power and control to overpower our enemies. And deep down, that is what we wish for. That's why it's deadly. Jesus, on the other hand, in Revelation 19, also rides a white horse, but he is drenched not in the blood of his enemies, but in his own blood. He is the lamb who was slain, who dies for his enemies. And the white horseman in our passage who uses control is always followed by the other three. Conflict, followed by dissatisfaction, Followed by death. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death. That is the way of the world that Revelation 6 tells us Christians to be wary of. That is the salvation which the world offers. The, it's white horsemen and it doesn't work because it always follows by the other three. It offers control which leads to conflict which leads to dissatisfaction, which leads to death. Hence, don't be tempted, don't be enticed, don't be misled. I remember growing up with only two TV channels. Anyone remember? (laughs) Channel 5 and Channel 8, yes, right? Maybe there were others, you know, but that's all my, my parents watched. If only things were different, you know, someone must have thought. What if we gave control over to everyone? What if we could watch any show that we wanted, any time we wanted, any time we wanted? You know, what if there were, for any device we wanted, we can even lie down on the bed on our own to watch any show we want, right? What if there were millions of different shows every day to entertain us all day? What if we give more control over the content creators? Anyone can create anything to watch, you know? 
Sure, there might mean no different content creators will be in competition with one another, but a little competition wouldn't harm. Sure, there'll be more conflict in the family because that means that parents need to be more vigilant in, in, um, and con and in over what their spouses and their children watch. But surely that would mean to happier and more contented lives. It doesn't work. Revelation 6 tells us the trajectory. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death. We have so much to watch that we don't feel like watching anything. <laughs> Nothing satisfies us anymore. How often do you channel switch, you know, on YouTube or that kind of thing? How short are our programs now nowadays? Well, if not entertainment, maybe education is the solution. If only everyone can chart their own path to take control of their own destiny, surely if we give more control and opportunities and choices to the younger generation, where everyone can have their own customized degree as long as they work hard, sure, that would mean that they need to constantly compete with one another over endless tests and over the bell curve. But surely that would give them a stronger sense of self-worth and a greater clarity of their life direction. It doesn't work. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death. Each generation is more and more lost on what they should do precisely because of the sheer amount of confusing options. It's so common nowadays to see people um, work in an industry that is completely unrelated to what they study in, only to change job every few years. Well, if not education, how about status? Let's offer everyone status. If only everyone could have equal opportunity to make a name for him or herself. If only there was a platform or multiple platforms where you can show anyone in the world what you're doing or saying or eating. Not only that, if only you can control what other people think of you. Only show them the good sides. Only show them um, the good aspects of your life. Surely everyone will, be, um, will feel more uplifted and more secure in their identity. It doesn't work. Social media has made us increasingly more insecure of ourselves and more jealous of others. We become increasingly pressured to maintain an impression we think others have of us at an increasing cost. Control. Conflict. Dissatisfaction, death. If not status, let's offer them intimacy. If only sexual intimacy was not bounded by a married man and wife. If only people were free to experiment before they get married and perhaps even after they get married, um, give everyone control over who and when and how sexual intimacy can be experienced. Your gender doesn't matter, your age doesn't matter, your marital status doesn't matter. It doesn't even have to be a physical person. Let's give them the option of experiencing sexual intimacy over a screen. Anytime, anywhere. It Surely, we'll have closer relationships and a more fulfilled society, it doesn't work. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death. How can a man be satisfied with his wife when now at the click of a button, he can experience intimacy with a hundred different other people? I could go on and name many other solutions, um, many other white horsemen which the world offers. Counterfeit Christ. But you get my point. In fact, you see it daily in your advertisement. And don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing um, entertainment or education or you know, job hopping or even social media. All these have their place when used rightly are good things. But every single one of them over-promises and under-delivers. Many will come to you as white horsemen. 
but the outcome is always the same. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, and death. And we have experienced it again and again, haven't we? And it's not only the world that bombards and tempts us with white horsemen. We ourselves are constantly tempted to create our own white horsemen in our personal lives. How do we identify them? Well, one way is when we use the statement, if only. Because if only is a conditional statement. Something hinges on the if only. Our faith rests on the if only. If only I had that special person, someone who would love and accept me and for who I am. Or if only my spouse would change into that special person, then I'll be truly happy. If only I was in my dream job, or at least know my, what my dream job is, then I will be fulfilled. If only I had children, or if only I was more recognized in my work, or if only I didn't need to worry about my money or, or, or my, my health back. Again, all these things are good things. But when we begin to see them as necessary conditions for happiness, or a sense of belonging, or identity, or self-worth, when we begin to make every endeavor to engineer and to control the outcome, or we beg God to engineer and to control the outcome, Revelation 6 predicts what will happen. Not satisfaction, not fulfillment, not freedom, not happiness. How many times have we said, if only we got something? What happens when we get it? We move on to the next thing. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death. Have you ever caught yourself saying, thinking like this before? If only I had this. I have so many times said that in my mind. You know. um, but there was one particular time uh, a few years ago where I found, where I said something which shocked me, actually. Shocked me. The nature of my job, um, as with men, as some of your jobs, you know, it is such that um, it is um, a significant amount of work and, and actually energy is used in um, nights and weekends. And this often competes with my family time, you know, especially time with my children. It's not only just time, you know, as young children just demand so much energy and capacity and love from you. And then at night, you don't get a good night's sleep because they wake up often. And quite, which makes me quite honestly not as loving as I should be, um, not as effective in work as I should be. Sometimes I feel I'm really just a pale a shadow of what I, I was or what I could be. Long story short, on rare occasions, I caught myself, um, uh, on rare occasions, I begin to catch myself thinking, if only I didn't have children. Now, my, my dear children, if you ever get to hear this <laughs> online or, you know, in, you know, in the future, in Judgment Day, <laughs> please forgive my moment of weakness. You all mean the world to me, and I, God knows that I'll give up everything, you know, for you. But on rare occasions, you know, I, I, I do... I found myself thinking and asking God, wouldn't I have been a more effective, you know, church worker for you if I had no children? Isn't your kingdom more important? Jeremiah 79 was God's answer. The human heart is deceitful above all things. And sometimes God told me, what you think as seeking God's kingdom is really seeking your own. Could it be that you are seeking your own sense of identity and fulfillment and affirmation in work? Could it be that your children is not a hindrance to God's kingdom, but yours? Everything, even things that we do for God, can be white horsemen. And as long as we let that happen, the outcome is always the same. Control, conflict, dissatisfaction, and death. 
then how, I ask God, if the world's salvation doesn't work, what is your salvation? When is your salvation? In fact, why are you allowing the world to continue masquerading counterfeit salvations? It turns out I wasn't the only one asking God that. A lot of others also ask God the same question. Verses 9 to 11, the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then the, they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they have been. How long, God, will you, will you wait until you bring about your salvation? The saints and the martyrs you know, were, were asking. And I really struggled with God's answer. Not because I couldn't understand it. You know, I mean, you can read it from the passage yourself. It's, it's quite direct. But I couldn't make sense of it. I don't know what it was for. I don't know what purpose it served. So let me highlight again God's answer in the passage. Until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. In other words, God was saying, until all my people who should die, die. The world, the world solution begins with salvation, or for salvation, but an appearance of salvation nonetheless, um, and ends with death. God's solution for the flourishing of the world and uh, the, ourselves begins with death. And for weeks, I, I couldn't make sense of it. That was what's going on. And I asked God, no, can I talk to you, please? And God said, absolutely, you know, but, but not about the sermon. I was like, but I, I want to talk to you about the sermon, you know. <laughs> it's coming up, you know, something else. You can wait until later. But God said, no, I don't want to talk to you about the sermon yet. I said, okay, but you know, after you talk to me, can I use it for sermon illustration? <laughs> and God said, no, you can't. I was like, okay, why? <laughs> he said, because I want you to put to death your desire to preach a good sermon, which I admittedly um, is not very difficult for me. La. I, I'm generally not very motivated <laughs> to appear competent or appear proficient in front of others. Some of you probably can tell already. Um, but as I scripted my sermon, I, I was reminded of something um, God asked me to put to death five years ago, which was far, far harder, which I will share because I'm not allowed to share what God you know, <laughs> talked to me about. Um, so just now I share about how uh, ministry work you know, and time and capacity for my children often clash and, and how on rare occasions I would wish that my children, um, I didn't have children so I can focus on ministry work. The, the flip side it was actually far more challenging and frequent for me. I remember when Luke was one years old, uh, which meant Paige was a few months old, which, means, which meant John was in my wife's womb. And, and because in my previous church, the church leaders and the pastors um, um, didn't want my family to be disrupting my work, so my wife often would be outside service, holding Luke on one hand, carrying Paige in a baby carrier, and being pregnant with John. Needless to say, this created plenty of conflict um, in church, um, in, at home, and then um, internally as well. I, I felt very, very torn. And, and I told God, please, I don't want to work for church anymore. I'm doing a poor job on both, you know, fathering and pastoring. I'm shortchanging both my family and my work. Uh, I, and how can I do that? I'm the father, I'm supposed to be the one sacrificing for my children. How can I ask my children to sacrifice for me? So I said, please, God, release me from my call. But God's call was so strong. I, I didn't realize that it was so costly to follow God's call. That I would need to sacrifice my family, my children, my wife, and for a period of time, I kept telling my, God, myself, I, I don't know, you know. Um, I, I really didn't count the cost. 
I really didn't count the cost. But who am I to go? You have the words of eternal life. I know what the world offers, you know, the four horsemen. It doesn't work. I know that. But I turn to God, the giver of eternal life, and He calls me to death. He calls me to, de- to put to death my children. What father would sacrifice his own children? That was precisely, I guess, what I was seeing and struggling in the passage. A heavenly father who sacrifices his children unto death so that the world can flourish. What father would sacrifice his own children? I am such a father, he told me. I know, I can see that clearly in the passage. No, no, you don't get it. I am such a father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And now we who have been adopted as God's children, he too gives us up to death so that the world can flourish. Revelations 8.1 When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence. Because no words can bring comfort to a father who has just lost his child. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Let me put this in no uncertain terms. What is God's plan for for the salvation of the world? By the death of His children. God's perfect plan for the flourishing, the redemption, the renewal, the perfecting of our world and every single individual in it requires the death of every single one of us. And the human mind cannot hope to conceive or understand it. Only the lamb who was slain can open the seal. Open the scroll to bring understanding. And I realized that I needed to fix my eyes on the lamb who was slain. Then I got my final peace. Why would our father sacrifice us, his children? Because he loves us. God calls us to die not only because he loves the world, but he because he loves us. And it's only by fixing my eyes on the lamb who was slain could I see that. Because the lamb who was slain is now alive and reigns with him. The lamb who was slain now experiences the fullness of life that God had intended. Death does not have the last word. God calls us to die so that our lives can experience the fullness of joy that God has intended for us. Standing in front of you, God needed me to put to death my desire to appear competent, you know, for you all to laugh or respond so that I could focus on being a channel of God's blessing by being faithful to His Word, difficult as it may be. Yet through that, God's life is poured in me and through me. When I go home every day, God calls me to put to death my desire for my children. Not my love for them, my desire for them. My desire to control and to engineer how I want them to turn out and behave and how I want the family to run. My desire to control and engineer their futures. so that I can truly focus on being God's steward, a channel of God's blessing for my family, not on my terms, but on God's terms. My way is the way of control. It doesn't work. 
God's way is the way of sacrifice. It does require at times putting my foot down and disciplining them, but never because I want to control them. You see the difference? And through that, God's life is poured into my family. What father would sacrifice his own children? A father who is truthful to us and shows us that the ways of the world doesn't work. And a father who loves us and knows us that the only and knows that the only way to life is through death. And it's only when we put to death all of our desires, companionship, control for our family, for the comforts of the world, for climbing the corporate ladder, so that we can focus on being God's channel of blessing to our workplace and our family and our friends and the world around us. And through that, God breathes His life-giving spirit and transforms the world around us. As we follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain and because of that now reigns with Him, we begin to experience more and more the fullness of life He experienced. We begin to be transformed more and more into God's blessing for the world that the Lamb has purchased by His blood. So here is the question. What is God calling you to put to death today? Let us pray. Even as we hear God's word, we struggle because it's not easy. But we see truth and we see life. And for some of us here, there are specific things that I think God wants to bring into attention. In fact, for some of us here, we are tempted to give what belongs to our spouse our husband and wife to someone else. We are tempted to give affection, connection, intimacy to someone else. And if that is you, God maps out for you the way of the world. Don't be enticed. It's not easy, but choose to invest again into the gift God has given you called your family. Some of us here are tempted by the ways of the world because we look around and we see that it seems to work for other people. And we're tempted to all in, all in, all in into our future, all in into our studies, all in into our, our work, to do whatever it takes to succeed. God maps out what will happen. So don't be enticed. Choose God's way. Some of us here, you know, control, conflict, dissatisfaction, death, you're at the dissatisfaction part. You have tried so many things and now nothing satisfies you. God wants you to turn around and choose His way to put to death, to put to death. And, and one group of, one last group of people, I think. Some of us here, 
have put to death so many things. You have given up so much for God. And to be honest, it doesn't seem to bear fruit. You invest, invest, invest into your family. You sacrifice, sacrifice, you sacrifice for God's work. And what is there to show for it? Nothing. It's not nothing. The world cannot see it. But God sees it. And He takes delight in it. So fix your eyes on the Lamb who was slain. He who sees all and knows all and takes joy in your obedience, however unseen and however small it is. And if any of you need prayer for any of this later, you can come up. So Father, we thank you for your word. Give us the courage and strength to choose the way of life that passes through death. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gabriel, for bringing us really a very somber message, but I believe it's a word of the Lord for many of us. And today, even as the worship team sing the response song. I'd like to invite us to, to come forward, respond to God. Let God truly be the one that will guide you into finding refreshment for your souls that you desperately long for. Shall we stand and ask the team to lead us? Christ alone will I glory Though I could pride myself in battles won For I've been blessed beyond measure And by His strength alone I'll overcome Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hands But these trophies could not equal To the grace by which I going to pronounce the benediction but Pastor Gabriel and the prayer team will be around and I just like to invite those whom you feel that you would like someone to just come alongside you in prayer you can come forward to the front and we'll be here to just minister with you so church the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding, our need to, to control things so that, Lord, we believe that that's the way to salvation. But how we have often found it leading to a place where we find dryness and death. But let us come to you because you are the one who keep our hearts and our minds with that perfect peace. Thank you for your word. Let it find a fertile ground in our hearts. So the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be 
with you and remain with you always. Amen. So church, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. God's blessing.